I'm so pleased to introduce Joshua Huffman, candidate for state senate in Virginia, who is joining us at Virginia Progressives to talk about his candidacy. Go ahead, Mr. Huffman. Well, thank you. Um, so yes, as mentioned, my name is Joshua Huffman. Um, tell you a bit about my background. Uh, for a long time, I was a political activist involved in numerous campaigns and elections. Um, more recently, though, I have been trained in political science. Um, for, I got my undergraduate degree from the College of William and Mary in government. And I earned a master's degree in political science from, from West Virginia University, uh, specifically with an, a focus on American politics and comparative politics. Um, and even more specifically, uh, looking at electoral politics and third party politics, both in the United States and in other countries. Um, so, of course, you may wonder well, what what got you interested in running for Virginia Senate? As mentioned, I am running for Virginia Senate District 2, uh, which is, includes Page County, Rockingham County, the city of Harrisonburg, Highland County, Bath County, and then about two thirds of Augusta County. So we're right there on the West Virginia border, for those uh, not as familiar with Virginia geography. Um, so what really spurred my interest was uh, back in uh, 2014, I decided to run for Harrisonburg City Council, and I decided to run as an independent. Um, one reason for that is actually bear the distinction of uh, being one of two people in modern times who have been kicked out of the Harrisonburg Republican Party. I'll be happy to talk about that later if you have questions. And um, so I ran as an independent candidate. And um, while I was running, of course, in order to make the ballot, I had to collect the signatures of registered voters uh, in the city of Harrisonburg. But I discovered that neither my Democratic nor Republican Party can uh, opponents actually had to do this. And of course, you know, collecting signatures is not something you can just do in an afternoon. It requires, uh, uh, quite, it requires uh, quite a bit of work. Um, and so I decided, well, I want to go to my state senator and see what we can do about this. And so, and that, of course, my state senator is Mark Obenshane. He's the current incumbent senator. He's been there for 20 years. And I asked, you know, it doesn't seem right, doesn't seem fair. Why, why is it that some people have to collect signatures and others don't? Um, we should work to change this. And he looked at me and he said, well, Joshua, if you're not a Republican or a Democrat, you shouldn't be allowed to run for office. And I thought that was absolutely terrible, um, especially, of course, when you look, up, look around the democracies um, throughout the world, they usually have robust elections where they have you know, half a dozen people or more running for an office. And yet here in Virginia, it's very unlikely that you have more than two candidates. And of course, for many elections, we only have one uh, because of course, the, the way the laws are set up, they are there to favor the people who are already in office. And, you know, so that's a big issue for me. Uh, I believe very strongly in competition, <laughs> regardless of what sort of, um, political ideology may have. I believe, you know, anybody in here should run, should be able to run for office if they so choose, and they shouldn't have to go through additional hurdles that neither Republicans nor Democrats have to do. Hey, great. That's fascinating. We, we have had a number of candidates uh, across Virginia who've had difficulty with the electoral mechanisms. You, you may be familiar with a candidate in Danville who was there was some confusion as to whether she uh, had to get signatures or pay a certain fee, right? And that yes. made some statewide news. The Democrats. I believe, unfortunately, I believe the Democratic Party establishment didn't want her to run, so they were trying to. I'm not sure the word sabotage the campaign may not be the right word, but certainly trying to hinder it. I think. It, it, you know, accusations went back and forth, and we can we can turn off the recording and speak candidly at some point. Okay. Um, but less well known, Brandon Riley uh, in Petersburg had similarly had difficulty with uh, with his signatures. He turned in signatures, and they were somewhere were, a large number were rejected as not being legible. And then he couldn't get voter lists. And when he finally got voter lists on his own, he found, he was able to demonstrate that many of his challenged signatures 
potentially enough, uh, you would have to speak to directly himself to, to overcome the objections were indeed valid. Uh, Latasha Holloway you, you had many of her signatures uh, disqualified, and I think there was some legal action around that. Alarmingly common um, the challenges around uh, people being able to, to, to qualify as candidates. We, we did also have some breaking of allegations of breaking of party neutrality pro closer to home in the 6th District, mm -hmm. the 6th Congressional District. So, um, yes, yeah, so it, it is not an isolated, uh, an isolated event. Um, well, and of course, one thing I found interesting during in my study of international politics, um, I, got, I thought to myself, well, how did it, I, I see over in uh, England that they seem to have parties come and go and all the time. And of course, when you see the election results, they get all the candidates standing up on stage and sometimes they have a dozen people or so. And so I looked into it. No, I, I forget the name of the uh, commission there in Great Britain. Uh, but in order to make the ballot there, there uh, a political party needs to submit a, a registration form where they say who's you know in charge of the party. And then now the price may have changed uh, today. Of course, this was several years ago. You just had to pay 150 pounds and then your political party was listed on the ballot in every single locality, in every single district in the country of England, um, without having to collect signatures or do anything else like that. And I believe that's a far healthier system than what we have in this country. But of course, when I looked into the history of ballot access, uh, it is designed specifically to try to hinder competition, unfortunately. What is your, your take on the substantive contest involving your, your other two opponents um, and maybe what you would like to achieve if you did get into the state Senate and how you view that? Absolutely. Um, well, now I'm still, to be fair, I'm still learning about my Democratic opponent. Um, I actually met her for the first time at the Augusta County Fair, which was about a week and a half ago. Um, and you know, I follow, follow her on Twitter. Of course, I also follow a Republican incumbent. And unfortunately, everything I've seen from her so far are just retweets from someone else. So, you know, I'm still, I'm, I'm still learning. Uh, so I'm not quite sure um, where she stands on issues. And that's why I don't want to misrepresent where, what her opinion is. And of course, I've known our state's current state senator, Senator Obenchain, uh, since he, his first campaign. Uh, as luck would have it, you know, being sort of a someone just fresh out of college at the time, uh, I was actually a volunteer for his first campaign. And, um, you know, before I guess before I knew any better, <laughs> you might say. And what he had me doing during in that campaign was he he when he was seeking the Republican Party nomination, um, he was trying to find out information about his opponent. And as such, he had me drive to and from Warren County, which is where his opponent was based, and you know, sort of comb through the newspapers there in Warren County. You know, the internet wasn't quite as interconnected uh, 20 years ago as it is today. Um, but that's the thing. I mean, I find so much of our current uh, state senator is centered around partisanship, which is dreadful. I mean. Um, he, if you if you happen to be a member of the Republican Party and he thinks you support support him, then he's happy to speak with you, and um, you know happy to talk to you and all those sorts of things. But like for example, um, of course I mentioned uh, in my speech that I uh, went to go speak to my state senator about ballot access laws. But one thing I didn't mention was that for almost a year prior he would not actually speak with. Me. Um, I would go to his legislative assistant and say, hey, I want to talk to my state senator. And he constantly refused, which just seemed to be horrible. And I think, of course, the reason was is because I wasn't a member of the Republican Party and therefore I wasn't worth the senator's time. Um, and, you know, that's one reason why I'm speaking with you all today. I mean, I'm happy to speak with anybody uh, who wants to talk about these issues. And, of course, you know, there are some areas, I'm uh, just reading over um, your policies, there's some areas where I agree and some areas where I disagree. And, you know, I mean, that's just how politics is. And I 
And I think that's healthy. And, but it shouldn't be, oh, well, you know, I'm not a member of this party, therefore I can't talk to you or you can't talk to me. And, you know, that's, that's one thing that's been tearing this country apart is uh, political polarization. You know, we get into our blue camps and our red camps and, you know, woe to anybody who tries to mix the two. But, um, like, for example, uh, of course, you mentioned Senator Sanders. Uh, back in 2016, uh, he, he came to Virginia and spoke in the uh, city of Charlottesville at a, at a uh, church there, and I went to go see him. And now, did I agree with Senator Sanders on all the issues? Of course not. Um, but I, I thought it was important. And, you know, I was glad that I did. And actually, as, as luck would have it, uh, you know, I was part of the standing room only crowd. They actually needed to get a bigger venue. Uh, they had people actually outside waiting for him as he came outside of the building. Um, but, you know, because especially like when it comes to his foreign policy, that was actually one place that I really liked Senator Sanders. Um, and, of course, foreign policy really doesn't have any bearing on uh, the Virginia General Assembly. Uh, so, I mean, we, we could certainly talk about that if you'd like. Uh, you know, I, I don't plan to dodge any sort of issue because I think it's all important, even, you know, again, whether I agree with you or not. But, um, yeah, yeah. So I, I think that dialogue is important. Um, and, I, and I hope, and I don't know, I mean, maybe you'll reach out uh, to both the Democratic candidate and our Republican incumbent. Um, and, you know, they, they may speak with you. I, I, I would be willing to bet good money that our uh, current state senator will not uh, because he said, well, you're not going to vote for me anyway. What's the point? But I think you really ought to look. You, we have to look beyond just our current election. I mean, so many politicians are so focused on what do I do to get elected or reelected? Um, you know, actually, a political scientist said that uh, if you look at American politics and you say every if you assume every politician's behavior is predicated on the idea that, do, that their first motivation is to get elected or reelected, then the behavior makes a whole lot more sense. Um, but I, I really think, and I, I think Senator Sanders did this as well, you need to sort of break beyond that mold and say, you know, I'm not just going to go to my base and say, you know, give you all the red meat you want and stir, stir it up and, you know, demonize my enemies or anything like that. But again, we, we, we need to look for ways in which we can work together. And even even times when we do disagree, you know, that we can still have that civil discussion. For example, um, I actually did a radio program on 550 WSVA, um, which is a, the biggest radio station here in the Shenandoah Valley. I think I did that for about eight years or so. I, I don't remember off the top of my head. And I did it in conjunction with a fellow named Andy Schmuckler, who uh, was the Democratic nominee uh, in the 6th District. Uh, what year was that? I think it was 2012. I think I'll have to, sorry if I'm, I, I don't have all my facts and figures because I wasn't, I wasn't exactly sure what I'd talk about. Um, but, and, and of course, initially, when we did the radio show, they said, well, why don't you all yell at each other more? And, and of course, I said, no, because, you know, you, you go on the, the, the major news networks, and you see the talking heads, and they're all just sort of trying to shout over each other and, you know, make the most outlandish points you can. And that, and again, I don't think that's healthy. Um, of course, uh, uh, Andy and I disagreed on many issues, though when it came to uh, electoral reforms, um, you know, gerrymandering, all that sort of thing, we, we pretty much down the line. And I, I thought it funny that the Harrisonburg Republican Party was so intent on trying to get me off the air. Um, and although I wasn't told why our show was canceled after about eight years, I think that probably <laughs> they, they, I, somebody bought the time slots, what they told us. And I'm guessing that that's what happened. But. I was a Bernie delegate in 2020. And you say you really liked Bernie Sanders' uh, foreign policy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm just curious what part you like for you. Let, I guess let me tell you what my foreign policy views are. And yeah. again, I, I, I know he agrees with parts of them. Um, you know, I, I have a... a a idea that we should have a non-interventionist foreign policy that the United States shouldn't be the policeman of the world, um, yeah. and that you know, it's better to trade with countries than to go to war with them. Yeah. And um, so, and which of course, 
Um, growing up, I thought that's what the Republicans stood for, but apparently these days, yeah, I don't think you can say that by any stretch of the imagination. Well, those are two pretty important ones, and, okay. but, except the Republicans have definitely started wars and things. over. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, well, and that was actually a big turning point for me was the whole Iraq war. Yeah. Um, because I didn't, I thought that, war, I, I believe in just war, and I thought that war was wholly unjustified. Yeah. Uh, now, not, not to say that I think Saddam Hussein was a good person, because of course, I think he was a terrible dictator, but I and I think in many ways what we did over in Iraq actually made things worse because of course we saw the rise of ISIS after that. Yeah, um, and they were warned. We were warned about that. Happening. Yes, we were yeah. absolutely. And I just and and that's the thing. It's like we we often employ a policy where we we don't really think about the future, and we, nor do we think about the internal politics of the area where we're going, and then we're surprised. Yeah, when um, we get a terrible mess yeah. as a result. But what would be your thoughts on rethinking how our approach to land, land use, and natural spaces? Well, and I think, um, you know, what, one thing I've, I've thought about in recent years is the idea of, you know, of course, you, you, you walk through this, the city, uh, cities and you find a lot of people with, you know, grass lawns both in the front and the backyard. And you know, my understanding is, of course, that that came about because people, at least initially, wanted to say, oh, well, let me show off my wealth. I've got so much money. I can have land that just uh, serves no real purpose. Um, but that being said, um, so, so I don't really, I, I think it's just sort of become a cultural norm. But I, I, I don't see anything wrong with people who, have their who who take their yards and actually return them to sort of more of a natural um, state than than just having you know the the uh, tightly mowed uh, sea of green grass um, because you know heck I mean we still have quite a lot of wildlife uh, in my home city um, regardless of that I mean we have rabbits that live in the backyard here um, now of course uh things like deer or in more wooded areas um and but i mean heck i've got a an aunt and uncle who live uh right on cherokee lake in uh rural uh tennessee and they, they routinely get you know packs of deer that just roam through their yard of course i know my aunt doesn't like the her eating the meeting her flowers but you know i i think I, there, there is something to be said for trying to live more harmoniously uh, with the natural world than, you know, just, again, having these uh, uniform um, suburb, green suburbs where, it, again, it, it, every yard looks the exact same and every house even sometimes looks the exact same if you got homeowners associations. Um, so, and, and I think that, of course, I think that sort of thing isn't necessarily something that could be, I'm not sure how much you could do about it legislatively, but, you know, just, just sort of telling people, hey, you know, there are other alternatives out here. You don't just have to have um, this kind of thing. I mean, there, there's not one um, particular uh, type of yard that's better than the other. I'm curious to know, if you'd like to make any policy changes to how the state of Virginia treats its guest workers, people that come here from other countries to um, to work, and uh, what you think the benefits and the drawbacks are for having guest workers in Virginia. Absolutely. Um, now, it's funny. Actually, I just completed a candidate survey uh, just the other day where they asked a very similar question. And I... Of course, as you all may know, uh, Governor Glenn Youngkin, our governor, has sent uh, the Virginia state troops uh, to the southern border to defend the border or something like that. But, and it's funny because um, as I actually, in, in my response to them, I uh, quoted uh, President Ronald Reagan. And I said, you know, I don't think the idea of building a border wall is a good idea because, you know, we... we we'd have better relations with uh, the country of Mexico and other countries if we had an open border. Well, open, I mean, obviously I'd like to know who's coming and who's going, of course. Um, but 
uh, you know, having migrant workers come in. I mean, for many years in the United States, so we did. That's what we did. Migrant workers came into this country, and then you know they uh, were here earning money. And then when they were the season, oftentimes when the seasonal work was over, they'd go back to their home countries. And you know, as Ronald Reagan said, you know, I think we should we should allow them to be here, work here. Uh, while they're here, they pay taxes, and then when they want to go home, they can go home. And I think that's a much better situation than what we have now, or, or what we're sort of going into. I mean, of course, I would argue there's certainly a racist component uh, to to our relationship with Mexico these days. But um, yeah, I, I I don't see anything wrong with it. Now, obviously, we don't want like you know murderers running through the streets of uh, Virginia or anywhere else for that matter. Um, but yeah, I think a robust migrant worker program would benefit really everybody. Um, so I, I would be very much in favor of that and we'd be happy to uh, support any sort of legislation that would lead us there. Um, but you know, again, so I certainly wouldn't support act, the actions our governor has taken regarding the border um, because at the end of the day, what, what does militarizing the border co accomplish? We're not at war with the, the country of Mexico. You know, we haven't been at, the, with, at war with Mexico for a long, long time. And I don't think, what, what sort of message does it send to both the people of the United States and to the larger world when, you know, we've got the largest border wall anywhere i mean heck you look at the at the uh, you may have seen photos of the border between the netherlands and belgium where they sometimes run through people's houses and but all it is is just sort of a line there in the bricks um and you know of course i've gotten actually a lot of discussion with um well not discussion because he doesn't respond but with our uh, representative ben klein who represents the sixth district of virginia and uh have been chastising him for that quite a bit because of course he said, you know, we got to build the wall and, and all that sort of thing. And I said, well, you know, if you claim to be a fiscal conservative, this is not a, a fiscally, building a wall is number one, it's not fiscally conservative. There's much better uses we have for our money than that. And that's actually another issue. Of course, when it comes to both building a wall and our foreign policy, um, you know, he, he uh, Representative Klein was very upset when, of course, President Biden, uh, attempted to do the whole student loan forgiveness issue. And I said, you know, if you had a choice between building a wall or building, bo you know, bombing uh, foreign countries, isn't it a much better use to actually help the citizens of this country? I think so. Um, of course, he didn't respond to that. <laughs> and I, you know, unfortunately, he doesn't seem to respond to anything I, I post on Twitter, but that doesn't stop me. Having done the little intro to MMT that we did at the very beginning, we now know that the whole framework is not correct about the scarcity, the scarcity of money. The real response to the wall you described in the sense of the, the peace between people and people who want to help build this country uh, and should be justly compensated. That's definitely a good thing for them and a good thing for the U.S. national interest now. The, the country that is losing that worker, that's another question that we, that we may want to take up. But... When we see that money is not scarce, that changes things in a, in a number of ways. And I think in favor of uh, canceling all student debt uh, from a Virginia progressive's position. But of course, when it comes to student debt, um, unfortunately, the costs of education just continues to grow. I mean, both in this state and other states. I mean, when I uh, went to West Virginia University to get my graduate degree, um, you know, I, I did have a assistantship, but it wasn't sufficient to the costs required. So I actually did have to take out a student loan at that time. And of course, I'm uh, going to be uh, presumably repaying that come October. Um, I'm not quite sure what the monthly payments will and that will be. But, you know, I, I would I, in many ways, I consider e education to be sort of the great equalizer in our society. I mean, no matter where you come from, what your background is. Um, education is important. And I, I wouldn't want someone to say, oh, well, you know, you're academically, you can achieve many great things, but unfortunately, you just can't afford it. And so I would, I'd like to see ways in which 
uh, we can make, uh, well, I guess here in the state of Virginia, because obviously the Virginia General Assembly doesn't have much control outside of that, but to make uh, university and, and even higher education available to as many people that want it. Now, I, I shouldn't say, of course, uh, conversely, you know, there's some people who don't want to go to college and I wouldn't say, you know, hey, you're going to college, you don't want to, you, you have a job that doesn't require it and you don't want it, that's fine. But, you know, I think for people who want it, I'd like to see, you know, I, I know in the past uh, the state has done tuition freezes for our state universities, um, which I think is great. Um, and whatever whatever way we can make it easier for, for people to achieve education without having a lifetime of debt as a response. Well, I certainly do thank you all for the opportunity to speak with me. Um, and now, I actually do have a website that I've just got up and running, uh, so I encourage you to, to go check it out. Again, it's um, still in the early stages. Uh, it's called uh, uh, principlesbeforeparty.com uh, because, of course, that's you know one of the themes of my campaign that uh, what you stand what you stand for is more, far more important than the letter that you've got behind your name, um, even though that's not, uh, <laughs> increasingly not in American politics. It's like, I don't care who you are, you know, are you a Republican, are you a Democrat, or what have you. But yes, yes. Uh, but no, I, I do thank you all uh, for the opportunity to speak with you. Uh, if you have additional questions for me, um, there actually is a contact form on the website, uh, and I'll do my best to reach out to you. Now, of course, um, you know, I can't necessarily say I'm going to get a same day response because, you know, sometimes my work does, uh, in case you're wondering, I'm employed by the city of Harrisonburg these days. I uh, hope to be a political, you know, actually teach political science sooner or later. But but in the interim, that I do work for the city. So, you know, if it takes a day or two for me to get back in touch with you, don't, uh, you know, don't think that's any reflection of myself on you. It's just I'm busy with other things. So.